Oh, thank you, Marcel, for inviting me. It's really great to be here. So today I will talk about uh, how learning actionable representations of biomedical data really allows us to tackle some of the new, very challenging problems in biology and medicine. So let me start. Um, science crucially depends on existing existence of scientific instruments. In, while in the past those instruments were primarily physical devices, such as microscopes, that have facilitated discoveries, in, in today's world what we need are new kind of instruments that are suitable for modern data-intensive sciences. And I envision in many ways those tools and instruments will be optimized for knowledge discovery from data. And there is lots of opportunities for those kind of tools in uh, uh, sciences, in health, and in medicine. And those opportunities range from uh, tools that can help us uh, preliminary diagnosing diseases, that can identify what are the clinical trials that would be best for patients, that can help us address administrative workflows and costly back uh, office problems in hospitals, all the way to protecting health data and taking care of um, long-term uh, chronic disease treatments. However, while those opportunities are really exciting, it's very challenging to realize this vision in practice. So what are the three key challenges that prevent us from realizing all these opportunities that we see for AI in health and medicine? There are two of those challenges. So first, what is often the problem is that when we think about these problems, we need to think about how to integrate and combine very challenging heterogeneous data sets that are confounded in many different ways and that span levels going from the molecular level all the way up to societal level. So for any particular biomedical problem that you might think of, there's often a number of data sets that are relevant for that problem and the data might reside in the form of different um, databases that were generated by different platforms, laboratories, institutes. They reside in all parts of different world as well as they come with different problems and uncertainties. And second, in order to make predictions really actionable, meaning that they can direct downstream experiments in the wet lab or really help clinicians, they need to be actionable. So what I mean by that is that we need to have means that allow us to translate hypotheses generated by algorithms into actionable hypotheses. So in my research, we think of networks or graphs as a very general mathematical language that help us tackle the first challenge related to the, com to the, to the idea of really being able to combine data at multiple different levels at the level of how in, within a society, a uh, population of individuals interact with each other all the way down to what are the different kinds of diseases that exist within a particular individual and down to a cell where different molecular components interact with each other in order to achieve a particular goal. And what is nice about networks is that we can connect these different scales to each other so that what we get is this multiple scale model that, that con contains very rich and multimodal data. So once we have such data representation, then the next question is, well, really need now to generate those actionable hypotheses that we were discussing about before. So what we do then is we develop methods that allow us to learn and reason over those uh, heterogeneous biomedical networks in the sense of learning very good and actionable representations, which I will explain in a minute, and, and generate predictions that then inform downstream experiments. And those predictions might be in the form of predicting patient outcomes, identifying potential, potential, potential targets of, of drugs, as well as predicting treatment regimes for patients. So in the next few minutes or so, I will give a very concrete example of this idea um, in, in, in the, for solving a particular concrete problem, and that is the problem of drug repurposing. So as you may know, the entire problem or procedure for drug development is extremely time-consuming and costly uh, procedure. It starts with more than 10,000 or more components, typically, and then through the process of developing a new drug, there are multiple stages and different kinds of procedures and experiments that need to be done. And those act as a kind of funnel that, that 
hopefully, by the end of that process that might take uh, 12 to 16 years and cost more than a billion dollars, we'll get one compound or a molecule that will have a desired therapeutic effect. So this is really challenging, and faced with this skyrocketing cost for developing new drugs, researchers, what we're doing now, we are looking for opportunities to repurpose a drug that, is exist, that already exists on the market for a new disease. And this is known as drug repurposing. You know, so in machine learning language, what the goal or task here is, we need to find what, given a particular drug or a molecule, what is the disease that that molecule could treat. So a bit more formally, what do we mean by that? So imagine having this gigantic bipartite graph, where in one part, what you would have, you would have uh, all drugs that are currently approved on the market, say, in the US. And on the right, you would have a large number of diseases or phenotypes that we need to find new treatments for. So the edges between drugs and diseases, those black lines here, indicate known drug treatment relationships. What is our task here is that we want to predict those new links between drugs and diseases. And the way we can really uh, operationalize and, uh, and, and tackle this problem is through the idea of learning representations of drugs and diseases. And our key insight here is to think about drugs and diseases not being a very single um, unit or a homogeneous um, uh, object, but really think of a disease as being an entire rich subnetwork or subgraph, which is defined by the kind of molecular changes in, the, in our bodies that lead to a disease. And think of drug as being, again, a rich subgraph defined by the kind of proteins that when a patient takes and ingests the drugs, those proteins change their activity in the body, hopefully with the goal of really treating the disease. So what we do then is we think of this problem as a problem where we have the underlying network or the describe to, that tells us how different molecular components, proteins, interact with each other in the bo human body, and those are these white circles here on the slide. And then on top of that network, we have a number of overlaid small subgraphs indicating our current knowledge about drugs and diseases. So in pharmacolo pharmacology, what is known is that a drug is likely to treat a disease if it is close to the disease in pharmacological space. But this is really hard to work with in practice. Like, what does computationally mean to be close in pharmacological space? There is no way to explicitly parameterize that. So our solution for that is to really leverage the power of embeddings or learned representations for drugs and diseases so that we first, what we do is embed drugs and diseases in some embedding space and measure closeness there as a proxy for closeness in, pharma in pharmacological space. A bit more detail what it means, this formally or prediction, the prediction test that we're solving here is that of predicting links between our drug disease subgraphs. So you can think of as an, our input consisting of a large number of drug disease pairs. Each pair is represented by a subgraph. And then our goal is to predict new links, new edges between those pairs. So the approach that we are using has two main components. The first is that of learning high-quality embeddings for drugs and diseases, and then using those embeddings, those are, those are low-dimensional feature representations for drugs and diseases, in order to predict probabilities um, that would be indicative of how likely it is that the drugs have um, really useful effect on certain diseases. The way we really learn embeddings here, which is what is the technical key challenge here, is through a recent uh, um, uh, approach known as neural message passing or graph neural networks, where the idea is that we learn what is the best possible way to propagate information along our, um, um, our underlying uh, molecular interaction graph and what's the best way to aggregate those information at the subgraph level. And we do that in the form of really encoding our drug disease subgraphs into some low-dimensional space and then decoding those representations back into the regional space. And defining an optimization function that achieves that goal gives us really high-quality uh, embeddings. Well, I won't go into details about the technical approach here. I will briefly say a bit about the results that we got. 
So after lots of classic machine learning uh, cross-validation that we do, that we did, we teamed up with uh, Stanford Spark Translational Research Program, and then we asked them, can you give us a list of drugs and diseases that were repurposed within that Spark Center over the last decade. So they gave us a list that looked like that, so this is part of the list. And we used that as ground truth information and then asked our model how likely it is that our model would also find those hits. So the way to read this table is, for example, the fourth row from the bottom, uh, is drug Carvedilol, which was repurposed for Chagas disease, and it was ranked by our algorithm as ninth most likely drug for treating Chagas disease in the US market. And you can see that also ranks are generally very low numbers here, so meaning that for many drug disease pairs, our method really performed well. So this was very exciting for us. It has led to an, an ongoing follow-up research that we have on prostate cancer at Stanford with the goal of identifying combinatorial drug therapy for, uh, for patients that would be personalized and would minimize uh, unwanted side effects, as well as schizophrenia. But how do we actually, as computer scientists, go and talk to domain experts, in this case, physician researchers, biologists, and medical researchers, and really convince them that our predictions and our really great, outstanding black box models um, yield results that they should trust? So very often, my first interaction with domain experts, when they, I come to them, I say, well, I have this model, it has this great AUC score, precision recall is wonderful, here are my top predictions. And what they would say is, why was that prediction made? Why do I now would be willing to spend lots of money, lots of postdocs, to validate your predictions if you cannot say anything about why that prediction was made? So the way now we think about these problems is in the form of this very high-level schematic presentation, but what we have is uh, the, um, our pipelines that uh, allow us and allow domain experts to interact with, uh, with our AI system. So domain experts can ask questions such as, for example, will benzamyl treat psoriasis? And then what is going behind, the, behind this question is our representation learning uh, uh, approach is, uh, generates predictions, provides predictions to domain experts. But then what can do, they can do, they can ask, what is the data that explains these predictions? And that's really important because then that can be used as part of the feedback back to the uh, AI system. So really then the question becomes how to explain those predictions when we are thinking about machine learning running on graphs rather than image data or sequence data. And we've been thinking quite a bit about that using counterfactual reasoning and causal inference to identify really small parts of the data that according to the model are crucial for making a particular prediction. And here's just one example where this methodology would be applied outside of the biomedical context in, in the, where the idea, where the goal would be to predict a, an activity that a person might actually enjoy in a social interaction network. But we, we really show how the approach that we have developed then also has very exciting uses for problems such as uh, dr uh, drug development and interaction with domain experts. And really what it does, it, it now allows domain experts to ask, for example, question, why did you, meaning the AI system, why did you predict that this molecule will have a certain mutagenic effect on gram-negative bacteria? And our model would say and would, would highlight what part of the molecular structure in that molecule is really crucial for, uh, for the model to make the prediction. So the GNN explainer, what it would show here is a subgraph here is defined on nodes and different functional chemical groups that, according to the model, are the reason for why um, a molecule would have mutagenic effect on a kind of bacteria. Okay, so in order to really generate actionable predictions, this means that those should be predictions that can directly guide experiments in the wet lab. And those predictions are often go beyond simple prediction tasks that we are tackling and solving in, in machine learning, or in particular machine learning on graphs, where we often think about problems such as link prediction, community detection, and node classification. But what you really need, or what domain experts need in practice, in being able to ask questions that go beyond just two entities, such as what is the drug that would target certain proteins and would treat disease as a particular disease that we want. 
So they would want to understand and know that because if you are able to answer this more complex logical question, then this gives a more immediate concrete idea on how to uh, design further experiments. So this is really where we need to go, go in order to make our computational predictions really transformed and translated into actionable hypotheses. So let me conclude here. I will just highlight some of the other applications that we did that were enabled by the, this idea of learning high-quality representations for, for knowledge networks. And I have men mentioned before drug rep repurposing at, uh, at Spark in this talk. But we also have really employed this uh, uh, technology for predicting safety and side effects of drug combinations, which has led to very interesting follow-up research and validations in the clinic. Um, and as well as using this approach for designing interactive AI systems that allow domain experts to interact with the model. But the main takeaway message of this talk is really that what we can do now is we can now apply those deep learning learned representations much more broadly than only to medical images or biological sequences. And this really creates new frontiers for problems in science and medicines that I'm very excited about. Thank you so much.